I'm very honored and very excited to be speaking to you. Um, I have a thousand questions. For example, why are you sitting all there? Is it to quickly escape if what I'm saying is boring? <laughs> or some other reason? The sun, maybe it's the sun, I don't know. Uh, I, I have a thousand questions. Uh, who uh, ever uh, used Wikipedia? Can you raise your hand? Everybody. Whoever edited an article in Wikipedia? Okay. Whoever edited an article in Wikipedia in Hindi? Whoever edited an article in Wikipedia in Hindi? You know that there is a Hindi Wikipedia, right? And uh, it is worth enriching. It is worth giving you know, your knowledge and your understanding and your passion and what interests you uh, to that as well. Um, and um, who uh, knows what is Moore's Law? Okay. It, 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 uh, do you know that it was the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law just a few weeks ago? Do you know how many data points uh, Gordon Moore had when he formulated his law? Um, guess how many? Uh, 100, 1,000, uh, 10. It was four data points. It was very, very few, totally unreasonable prediction. And of course, it's not a physical law. It is just a prophecy. And you are working very, very hard to make it come true. Generation after generation after generation. Okay. Um, who heard of the Google robotic cars? Okay, good. Um, who heard of uh, 3D printing of human organs? Okay, 3D printing of meat to eat? Okay, all right. So these are some of the themes that we are going to be talking about. And these are the things that uh, at Singularity University we study. We have a 10 weeks summer program at NASA Ames uh, where students come from all over the world um, 80 students get accepted out of three, 4,000 candidates every, every year. And starting this year, all the tuition is covered by Google. So uh, six years ago when we founded uh, Singularity University, uh, Google uh, was one of the partners. And uh, Larry Page is quoted uh, saying at our opening ceremonies that if there was any place where he wanted to study, if he were 20 years old, Singularity University it would be. Um, and there, uh, what we focus on is uh, the impact of exponential technologies on the enterprise, on uh, policy and governance and on the life of uh, individuals, of how people live, and why uh, all the world around us is shaped by, by technology. Um, I'm also a former chairman of uh, uh, Humanity Plus, which is the World uh, Transhumanist Association. Who has heard of transhumanism? Okay. Um, there are many ways of looking at what it means to be human. And according to transhumanism, uh, one definition or one of the better definitions is that to be human is to understand and try to overcome your own limitations and to redefine yourself constantly through this process of, of innovating and maybe even revolutionizing what it means to be human, both uh, in, in, in your life and the way you create society, the way you understand uh, technology. And uh, in many parts of the world it is a fairly controversial uh, stance because it is, please, because it is um, seen as um, too radical and pushing things too far. Um, while people, a lot of people, even those who embrace new things, not necessarily too conservative or traditionalist, say no, there should be limits beyond which you don't go, you don't want to go, and you cannot tell that to transhumanism per definition, it wants to go beyond those, those limits. Um, and uh, I am very frequently traveling. Um, I have three children and a wife in Italy, in, uh, near Milan. 
and uh, uh, my company, DotSub's headquarters are in New York. So I commute every two weeks between Milan and New York. And we have teams in, in uh, Canada, in Europe, in Argentina that I visit as well. But I also go at conferences. So this is my first time in India. And uh, I arrived in New Delhi, spent a few days, organized a little meeting uh, yesterday just at a cafe with a few people who on Facebook learned about the meeting and came. Um, tomorrow I will be going to Goa for other meetings and then I will be speaking at TC World, which is a conference in Bangalore. And uh, then I will be in Spain, in Greece, back to China, then to New York and so on. And the reason I'm telling you this is because in today's interconnected world, more and more people define themselves as technomadic. Nomadic, meaning that they travel around the world, but technomadic, so nomadism based on technology, where uh, if you have Wi-Fi, you feel home. If uh, you have a, a, a place to charge your phone or your computer, you barely need anything else. Uh, and of course, you still need food, you need water, you need to sleep somewhere, you need to wash yourself uh, here and there. But still, uh, the, the leveraging uh, what you do is possible through uh, this technology. And it is available, of course, everywhere in the world. DVI was right, it is the sun. Don't you want to sit there too? You will be too close to the students? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, I will try to speak for not more than about 40 minutes in order to leave more to our questions. I have almost 200 slides, so it means that if you make the, the division, this will be almost a movie, going through slide after slide, and I hope uh, you will enjoy it. Um, since this rhythm is pretty intense, um, just take note of whatever comes into your mind and we will have a conversation afterwards rather than stopping me, okay? And uh, let's see how it goes. So I told you about a little bit Singularity University. I didn't mention to you the latest uh, of, of uh, uh, the things that I, I did. Network Society Research is a nonprofit that I created in London and uh, which is um, um, now represented by uh, 22 ambassadors in 17 countries uh, to understand how going from centralized and hierarchical organizations we are now possibly better off totally rethinking and re-architecting how we work in our societies and even how we live based on networks and decentralized and distributed organizations instead. Okay. So the themes that we are going to look at through those many slides uh, certainly are around technology and what are the unexpected consequences of technology. So I asked you before if you knew Google robotic cars and most of you, almost all of you said that you know what they are. They are cars that can drive themselves, right? For those who haven't heard of them. And they are being introduced in California and legislation is being updated so that they can actually be sold or rented or, or, or leased. And then I ask you whether you knew about 3D printing of human organs. And a few, fewer people said that they, they heard about it. So 3D printing is, is manufacturing through depositing and 3D printing of, of living tissue is a little bit more complicated, of course, with uh, uh, fluids that need to keep the layers alive and 3D printing of organs is even more complicated because you need to give uh, the cells that you put together a given structure and the right signals so that they develop the relationships uh, between each other that are appropriate. And so the question is, what is the relationship between one and another? And the relationship is that with robotic cars it is expected that accidents will drastically diminish because robotic cars don't drink, don't sleep, don't use their mobile phones while driving, uh, respect uh, speed limits and uh, traffic signs. Um, they will look really alien here in, in, in India. They will be like 
people will, what, what are you doing? <laughs> why, why are you driving like this? Are you crazy? Uh, but no, they will be just robotic. However, uh, the first cause of death in many, many countries for people between 25 and 35 years of age is traffic accidents. So young people will stop dying and old people will still want their replacement organs because old people use young dead people to take their hearts, their livers, their uh, kidneys, their eyes and so this is a problem in search of a solution and the solution is 3D printing of organs right? and it is a future that is very very rapidly approaching uh, think about uh, the insurance industry which is based on uh, managing uncertainty statistically so that everybody can be put in a bucket and according to their lifestyle, their, their age mainly, but also some other factors, this statistical uncertainty can be mo modeled and then uh, uh, there is a likelihood of uh, you getting ill or something else and the insurance company knows how to make a profit on grouping people together. But DNA uh, sequencing is becoming more and more available and we are better and better in associating the probability that a given genotype will give rise to a given type of illness. For example, I have my genes sequenced and I know that I have twice as much probability to have glaucoma, some problem with the eye, than the normal population. But I have a third less probability of something else, I don't remember. And this type of information will make it less likely for people to get insurance if they think they don't need it or more likely to get insurance if they think they will get ill and the insurance companies will go bankrupt. They will not be able to manage the statistical risk around grouping of, of people. And of course we are talking a lot about inequality and, and how in Western countries uh, also inequality is increasing, income inequality and the distribution of wealth is accruing to fewer and fewer people while the middle classes uh, are thinning out and maybe poverty is, is increasing too. Uh, and nobody knows exactly what the solution is but companies, for example, those that are leveraging exponential technologies are becoming incredibly effective in accumulating wealth. Apple Computers, for example, is now worth more than any other company on earth and they have a hundred billion dollars in the bank. And that is the power of your ideas. That amount of money in the bank by the best company in the world means that your ideas are incredibly valuable because they are scarce. Apple doesn't know where to put the money. There are not enough good ideas around. So if you bring good ideas to the world, there is no scarcity of resources, of capital. Those are all very, very abundant. So exponential technologies, as I said, are what we study at Singularity University. And I really invite you to uh, look at it. Um, there will be the um, uh, selection of an Indian candidate winning a, a, a position at Singularity University through a local contest. And next year, if you, if you want, I don't know whether, what, what year you are at, uh, because I don't want to say that you need to drop out or you want to drop out, but even if this is a summer course, so you may just go for the course. Next year, you might want to enroll in this uh, uh, contest held here in India. It's called the Global Impact Competition in order to win possibly uh, uh, a seat at, uh, at Singularity University. This chart represents Moore's law, which is what we were talking about at the beginning. From a few thousand uh, mainframes to mini computers to workstations, then a few hundred million personal computers, now we are at billions 
of mobile phones. But technology and its evolution is not stopping there, and the next generation of devices will count in the tens, the hundreds, and the thousands of billions. And the mobile phone is actually the last generation of products that can rely on us of managing them. The generations after, there will be so many that they will have to be designed, deployed, and managed through completely novel principles that have pretty little, very little to do with, with what we are accustomed to. And this exponential change confounds experts even more than, than uh, newcomers to a field. Experts know very well what cannot be done, and so their pattern recognition discards weak signals. Somebody like Gordon Moore in his time, who believes in the power of just four data points and very strongly projects this message and everybody else around the world wants to prove him right and, and, and succeeds, um, is part of the group that is able to latch on these weak signals. Any grouping, and it doesn't matter whether it is 18 months like Moore's Law, or it is 10 years, which is actually the doubling of the performance of batteries. And now with solar power, we want batteries that are very good. And electric cars, we want batteries that are very good. And our phones, we don't want to keep charging them. But it takes 10 years to work and have engineers that think of better ways to make batteries charge faster, hold more uh, charge for a given unit of mass, and so on. It doesn't matter whether it's 18 months or 10 years, doublings are what matters. And um, there was a, a very big project, the Human Genome Project in the US, uh, $3 billion of funding, 15 years, started in 1985. Seven years later, the program was only at 1% of its goal. And experts were saying, hey, we have to stop this. This is a bloodshed. This is horrible. It will take us not 15 years. It will take us 700 years to get 100%. They were thinking linearly. They didn't understand that the 1% was actually achieved through constant doublings of the performance of the project. And actually, in the year 2000, with perfect timing, the project achieved its goal because after the first seven doublings, if you get to 1% and you keep that same pace, you only need another seven doublings and you will have actually exceeded 100%. Because from one you go to two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, and there you go. And of course, technology doesn't stop. So today, after another 15 years, we don't need $3 billion in 15 years to decode the human genome. We actually can, this was last year, have an entire human genome decoded for $2,000 in two weeks. But technology doesn't stop. So now it is projected that in 2020, an entire human genome will be decoded in real time by something like a sensor in your mobile phone or in an appliance in your home at the cost of two cents. So imagine in a world that uh, will make that kind of information available. What can be done with it? The President of the United States is followed and protected by the Secret Service that has many details. One of the details is the people who jump in front of the bullet. And another detail is following the President with a vacuum cleaner. And the vacuum cleaner is used to pull up his DNA, the skin flakes, anything he touches, so that other people cannot get his DNA and do whatever with it. So there are two parts to this exponential curve, right? The deceptive part that confounds experts. It is better not to be an expert in some ways if you want to be able to, to, to believe in what is going to happen. Um, and then another part that uh, allows everybody to jump on board and say, oh yeah, I knew it all the time. It was so clear. Um, William Gibson, the science, fi science fiction writer. Uh, anybody read anything uh, by William Gibson? Do you like science fiction? Who likes science fiction? Good. Um, I will want some 
some advice from you what Hindi science fiction I should read in English. But still, what are your local favorite authors? Uh, William Gibson started in the 90s at the cyberpunk movement in science fiction. And a few years later, he stopped writing science fiction about the future. He still writes very good books, and his books are in the present. And he's quoted saying, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And the future was always around. You know, people were dreaming of what could be achieved. But the point is that technology was not necessarily there to support them. And your dreams cannot be sustainable unless this technology basis is there. If you were an Egyptian slave and you uh, were dreaming of freeing yourself, of emancipating yourself, you could do nothing about it to change your condition. And in the Middle Ages, uh, there were the vassals and there were um, you know, very strict relationships between uh, the uh, noble class and the peasants. But technology kept evolving. And today, in our industrial society, actually, fewer and fewer people are working the fields and feeding everybody else. Okay? And fewer and fewer people are working in factories and creating all the material objects that everybody else uses. And most of the people are working in types of jobs that require a lot of knowledge and a lot of skills and all the technology basis to make them possible. This is our globally connected uh, world today. The achievements that we have are incredible looking with the eyes from the past. And they are actually in the um, term of Paul Crutzen, a Nobel Prize winning uh, chemist who discovered the uh, ozone hole uh, worthy of being defined uh, with a new word, which he says is the Anthropocene, the geological era characterizing today's world as the geological era defined by human presence on the planet. This chart, uh, originally designed by Daniel Dennett, a philosopher, is uh, representing uh, the global terrestrial biomass of vertebrates, dividing them in two groups, uh, wildlife and humans, our pets, and our cattle. Okay? 10,000 years ago, the proportion was 99% in favor of wildlife. Today, on overall on the planet, uh, as demonstrated by the fact that it's three days I'm in New Delhi and I haven't seen an elephant yet, is totally in favor of people, our dogs, our cats, our cows, and whatever else. And this is certainly, clearly, unsustainable. It is a situation that cannot go on. We don't have another continent to pillage. Uh, we Europeans went to America and changed it, went to everywhere else and changed it. Today, there are no new continents available. The method that we used for the past thousands of years to expand and to use up the resources that were available cannot be applied anymore. Actually, the question is, is the only difference between humans and dinosaurs is that they didn't have telescopes? And are we using both our physical telescopes at their best, as well as more metaphorically, our mental telescopes for exploring what we can about the world with science, with reason? The interaction of hardware, software, and design in computers as we create new chips and new operating systems and new applications is really amazing. A lot of people make the mistake of saying, well, exponentials are great, but hey, every exponential is bound to be exhausted because really what you are talking about is just the knee of the curve in an S-curve, in a, in a logistics curve. But that is not what we mean by exponential acceleration of technology. What we mean 
is the uh, progressive replacement of technologies by new ones and it is the compound curve that is exponential not a single logistic curve transistors came after vacuum vacuum cubes to tubes to uh, uh, be the building blocks of computers transistors were uh, replaced by integrated circuits and integrated circuits are replaced now when we are reducing the uh, elementary components of computers uh, to uh, atomic levels, to nanoscale, by quantum computing, which is uh, arriving at Singularity University at NASA, there is now a quantum computer that Google and NASA both together, that Google used and studied for image recognition uh, processes, and uh, it performs better than any classical approach, any classical um, uh, computer that they uh, put at the same task. And when computers started, they were blind and they were deaf. They knew nothing about the world. We had to teach them very, very painfully everything. And at the beginning, they didn't even have memory. When you turn them off, they forgot everything, and the day after, you still had to feed them the punch cards to start over from scratch. Then with teletype computers, it became a little bit easier, and then we started using command line interfaces, still just for the specialists. But passionate people were now able to get their hands on the personal computers and learn about them, but also to teach these computers more and more things. And then graphical user interfaces came about that made it very easy to manipulate uh, the analogs of, of physical objects on the computer screen that expanded greatly the number of people who could start teaching things to computers. And then these got colorful. And finally, computers started to um, understand how to interpret touch. This was an important step because it freed uh, computer design and the form factor of computers from the geometry and the physical constraints of the human finger and the human hand. And things didn't stop there. Computers started to see and to interpret gestures and our movement and understand our bodies and our posture. And now, um, with speech recognition becoming better and better, screens are going to disappear as well because information doesn't necessarily need to be displayed in traditional ways but it can be conveyed acquired and then conveyed back through a conversation and conversational interfaces dialogue systems are going to be an important uh, step in this direction and of course india is the world headquarters of human dialogue right uh, call centers supporting users all over the world, English-speaking users, are all in, in India. So the question is, what are the companies that are managing these call centers understand about this shift? Because the human-to-human dia uh, human -human dialogue over the internet is just uh, going to be a very small percentage of the overall conversations. And things are not stopping there. We are now going towards uh, brain-computer interfaces where directly computers are able to understand our thoughts and uh, are going to not only be able to read them but also to write them. In general, it can be stated that there will be two categories of objects. And one of these um, is the category of objects that are um, uh, that possess memory, computation, understanding of their environment, location, um, and they can communicate in various ways with other objects or with people, smart objects. And the other category is those objects that do not have these characteristics, and the additional cost of providing smarts to any object is going to decrease so sharply 
that the benefit of an object being smart is going to outpace very rapidly this cost and the first category will uh, out evolve, out compete the second category. There will be nothing that is not going to be able to communicate, to reason and the old paradigm of centralized hierarchical systems that were based on the difficulty of communicating across systems because communication was easily achievable only within a given system is going to give way to a new paradigm of distributed, decentralized, globally connected networks, not only in information technology, in the internet, in IT, but in every type of organization, anything that you want to achieve. Solar energy, for example, as opposed to gas, oil, or nuclear plants, doesn't have a 10 or 20 or 30 year return on the investment. Anybody can decide to put a solar panel on his or her home or in the office. Apple Computers, once again, announced about a month ago a billion dollar investment in a solar plant to generate electricity for all their data centers and all their stores in California. 3D printing is distributed decentralized manufacturing. Rather than sending an order to China for a million pieces of something and then wait six months until they are ready, run an advertising campaign, you are able to create an object in your home or in your office. And, and Boeing, the aircraft maker, recently published a report. There are 20,000 3D printed parts in a Boeing airplane today. Okay? 20,000 3D printed parts. So it is not for prototypes, it's not for play. You trust your life when you fly to 3D printers. Think about uh, um, hydroponics, um, vertical gardens, urban gardening, 3D printing of meat. Uh, it is possible to totally rethink of how agriculture works uh, in controlled environments, no need of pesticides, uh, with as much variety of food as needed, and very importantly, with a radical reduction of energy, water, soil used, because that is very scarce world over, and with the increasing population, and with our desire to give good food, healthy food, abundant food to everybody, uh, it is now possible to transform agriculture from an activity that is proportional to the area occupied to one that grows with the volume. So imagine this building has six or seven or ten stories. Imagine if one of the stories was dedicated to growing the food of uh, the canteens that are uh, probably here uh, serving you lunch. Uh, and you would have solar panels on, on, on the roof giving energy both to this and to, to the rest of the activities. Personalized health with smartphones that enable you to uh, monitor your state of health rather than becoming ill and then go to a hospital to make sure that you understand your body quantitatively. Online learning, of course. The possibility of learning from the best teachers to use local interactions among students, among uh, uh, local professors to get deeper in the subject, but with knowledge available to anybody and everybody, anytime. Um, finance is also a technology. It is easy to uh, point a finger and accuse banks and the financial system uh, to have caused the worldwide crisis in 2008 or the next one that is going to come whenever. But just as we cannot do without electricity, we cannot do without our financial technology. Actually, we have to keep it evolving. And Bitcoin, who heard of Bitcoin? Okay. Who owns a fraction of Bitcoin? Okay. So um, anybody, if you give me your email address, I will be happy to transfer you a fraction of Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, then I will ask you to send maybe a third or half of that to a couple of friends to spread it. Uh, Bitcoin 
is revolutionary for many reasons. Uh, and one of the reasons is, is because it takes away political control of money. Money and currency are extremely valuable for politicians to control, of course, and to exercise power through that control. But often that is the reason of the problems that finance encounters. Uh, taking away that control, giving it over to an open source algorithm that is available to anybody, lowering the barriers to entry for the creativity of app developers who are now flocking to this new technology for implementing their new ideas is going to create empowerment all over the world. Everywhere I go, I stay at Airbnb. I don't stay at hotels. Here in New Delhi, next month in Shanghai, in Istanbul, wherever. The trust networks that Airbnb and Uber and other... Who heard of Airbnb? Okay. Uber? Okay. So these are said to be competing with hotels and with taxi services. No. They are competing with police. The traditional ways of enforcing trust through violence is over. It is not needed. It is much better to be able and trust another person directly and to know that the cost of non-compliance is much higher and it, it, it is, it is uh, much better to be part of the network and the cost of being excluded from the network is, is just unaffordable. And as soon as in any place in the world you know what network to belong to, is you have a platform that you can leverage. Yesterday um, we held a meeting, there were, were maybe 10 people together, not more, at a place I've never been, uh, with people that I was meeting for the first time, uh, and it came together over Facebook in maybe not a week or so, maybe a week. Um, the hardest of, of these transformations is policy. How uh, governments, central and local governments, discuss, enact, uh, monitor and modify regulations and policy in order to keep up with these technological changes. It's very, very hard and the speed of their um, understanding is not high enough. On the other hand, with an accelerating rate of adoption of these changes, there will be wider swings. Mistakes will have wider consequences uh, and there will be more inequality between cities that adopt better policies and cities that are slower or are just making the wrong choices in, in policies. However, what I think is important to understand is that these changes are unstoppable. Each of them can be thought of as a fad and frequently incumbents who have an interest in maintaining the status quo will um, sponsor media coverage uh, that says, oh, solar energy will never make it. Look at it. It's only 1% uh, of energy generation. It will take thousands of years to get uh, to 100%. They don't understand exponentials. You understand exponentials now. I showed you that 1% means that games, the game is over, that the, the doublings are going to keep going. And this, these are the things that we are talking about at Network Society. The future is coming. You know, we are all time travelers. I don't know whom, who, uh, which of you have seen the, the, the movie here. Uh, we are all time travelers at one minute per minute. Okay? And future is the place where we are all going together. And whether you look at New York or you look at Shanghai, you don't even see the difference. Uh, our global civilization needs solutions that can be very rapidly brought from one place to another. Um, the uncertainty around uh, exponential technologies is, is real though. The difficulty of predicting their consequences is not out of ignorance. It's not out of uh, uh, not uh, trying hard enough. It's intrinsic. So um, getting into the to the meat of, of, uh, of today's um, argument or, or, or lecture. I told you about uh, the fact that, uh, in my opinion, uh, this is the last generation of machines or mobile phones that can rely on us to do things that they need, right? Uh, 
And we believe that, that uh, we are in charge. And sometimes we are, but uh, it is really a co-evolution of, of uh, will and desire and objectives. Uh, when I uh, learn how to use my phone and I set up my alarm right, that's great. But if the phone is muted and the alarm is not sounding, then I, I was wrong. I, I cannot use it the way I want. When the phone starts flashing some signal on the screen to say it needs to be recharged, uh, I am programmed to feel anxious if I cannot charge a wall socket and it will be my main purpose wherever I am, whatever I do to recharge the phone. Um, but if a thousand devices want me to uh, keep an eye on them and recharge them all the time, I won't be able to. I will just give up throwing the towel. But these devices are going to come nonetheless and it is not about recharging alone. Of course it is about uh, managing their, their deployment. How do they get into the environment? For example, today mobile phones are everywhere, humans are. Obviously, we bring them everywhere. Uh, but sensors in the environment need to be deployed, need to be managed. Um, who heard of IPv4, IPv6? Okay, so today's internet is broken because of IPv4 the um, symmetry uh, between computers has been substituted by an unnecessary distinction between client and server. It's wrong. Uh, uh, network address uh, uh, transversal or translation, NAT, I don't remember uh, the acronym, what it stands for, that allows Skype to uh, punch a hole in firewalls and establish communications across networks is, is a cludge. And we suffer from it. You know, the entire architecture of Facebook is predicated on this asymmetry, and it's wrong. With IPv6, we now are in the position of re-establishing the original architecture of the Internet that was peer-to-peer. -peer. No difference between devices and networks that participate paritatically in providing value to the users. Um, I don't remember exactly, but uh, people are saying, well, won't IPv6 addresses also get exhausted? So I made a calculation once, and I calculated, I think it is something like 21 quadrillion humans could be mapped with an IPv6 address for each of their cells. So we have plenty of IPv6 addresses. Um, and the, the, uh, there is a, a beautiful um, tale, well, many, making a difference between maps and territories. Maps are always an approximation of a territory, of physical reality. Well, we are now in the process of mapping our territory, our physical reality, at an approximation that is arbitrarily fine. We are really getting into the details, potentially mapping both in space and in time reality around us in order to find the best way to drive value out of it. And this value stack, the web of data generating non the knowledge, the web 2.0 social network applications, mapping relationships between humans are now going to go into the Internet of Things understanding the world and mapping value uh, in the world. Autonomous devices are already de real. The Roomba robotic uh, vacuum cleaner uh, allows you to leave the house and have it just swipe the floor, clean up the dust. It will map out the room on its own and when the uh, it senses that its energy is running down, it will, it will find a way back to the wall charger. Okay? So you don't need to worry about it. And then it will start working again when the charge is up. And the conversations, um, uh, I don't know if it happened to you, when you go on, uh, in your car and, and your car radio is on and your phone is close to the car radio, Sometimes there is a very characteristic noise, a to -do -to -do -to -do -to -do -to do to do and not many people think about it. That is 
machines talking to each other, becoming hearable, audible by humans, just very rarely. But communications among machines is now what is the dominating conversation on the planet already. And this amount of conversations that we don't even see or hear is going to increase in proportion in the future. The most uh, powerful and expensive and exciting machine ever built, who recognizes this image? CERN. Go ahead. Yeah, it's at CERN. It's the Large Hadron Collider, uh, 25 billion euro to build, 25 billion euro to manage through its life cycle. 99.99% of the data is thrown away without any human ever seeing it. It is analyzed by machines, it is decided by machines what are the images that are worth storing and then going back to looking at it again and then maybe sometimes alerting a human, hey, come over, look at this, this looks interesting. And only those are the rare, rare images, just a sliver of the images uh, or, or the data generated that I ever seen by a human. Um, so the autonomous car is important and uh, uh, I'm going to use it to, to talk about morals uh, briefly because uh, it is going to have to make decisions. It is already making decisions. There are now cars, uh, Tesla, Volvo, other Mercedes, BMW cars that basically do everything by themselves. The laws are still not updated so a human driver needs to be there but they can follow the road, they can keep the distance uh, with the car in front of them and if there's no car they accelerate up to the maximum allowed, uh, they um, can do a lot, you know, when you stop you push a button and they park, uh, parallel park themselves and so on and so forth. When these machines are going to be totally self-driving and it will be allowed for people who don't even have a driving license to sit in them. They will not even have a steering wheel. They're, they will have a completely new design. Uh, and and um, imagine mothers who shuffle young children from the school to, I don't know, some lesson or uh, they will be totally free finally to do what they want to do. I will totally entrust my daughter to uh, uh, a robotic car that will be more reliable than uh, human drivers. Still, there will be times when hard decisions will have to be made. Uh, there will be a cyclist swerving, um, coming onto the road with a robotic car behind, and in order to avoid the cyclist, the robotic car would have to crash into a school bus and a choice will have to be made. The car will have to decide whether it kills the cyclist, most likely, or it will crash into the school bus hurting or killing school children. Right? Um, have you heard of the trolley problem? Okay. So the classical trolley problem faced by the robotic car and it is very simply not possible to do this without a sound basis, first scientifically and then in terms of implementation of what it means to make moral choices. However, there is also another reason which potentially is even more important. There are sudden shifts, you know, I spoke about solar energy. NBAD is the National Bank of Abu Dhabi, the world's richest nation in oil wealth, declares that additional energy generation capacity and financial investments for that will come through renewable energy, mainly solar. This is the oil producing nation whose wealth is dependent on petrol being burned and they are saying we're not going to do that and the reason is not because they uh, became 
radical environmentalists suddenly or, or, or they want to ruin their own nation. The reason is economical. Now solar energy is competitive with any other kind of generation and they understand it. This is a chemical film. For 100 years, Kodak, the film company, was um, a leading, world leading brand. 110,000 workers and they didn't understand the digital shift and the digital camera revolution and the app revolution and they are bankrupt. They are gone. And a dozen people can create an app like Instagram both for more than ten billion dollars by Facebook in a completely different manner, in a completely different world. Sudden shifts happen and the Internet of Everything, the Internet of Things, is going to represent such a sudden shift where we will have to make hard choices about the fundamental architecture. And we have to be very alert of what the consequences of these choices are. IPv4, for example, was okay for the time, but very quickly, in merely 20, 30 years, its problems created the world uh, of privacy breaches, of government spying, uh, of uh, vulnerabilities, of cybercrime that are a direct consequence of architectural mistakes. Computers are going to be able to read and write our emotions. Um, the way our DNA is sequenced and then the DNA is printed, the way our emotions are read, and the way emotions then are printed is becoming more and more sophisticated. Soon you will be able to um, understand why Facebook is not at all an exception in running this experiment where they were looking at showing you uh, positive news or negative news on your, uh, um, on your wall and then seeing whether you would be more positively or negatively uh, expressing yourself in your posts. They were writing your emotions. And this could be positive, you know, this could be a good thing. If my uh, smartwatch senses that my pulse is increasing and it doesn't understand why, because I'm sitting at my desk, but then looking at my calendar, it sees that a phone call is coming up with my boss and it can decide to play a soothing music and then see the feedback that my heartbeat is slowing down, the phone call comes, and it goes all well. This is a very good application that is already doable today. So who heard of uh, IBM Watson? IBM Watson uh, is a supercomputer that is not connected to the internet that won uh, uh, an American uh, show um, where you need to answer questions that contain jokes, wordplay, irony, uh, all kinds of tricks to, to, to fool you, beating the human champions uh, of all time. And it did it by being able to digest and cross-correlate non-structured data, not databases, but Wikipedia, books, and, and, and things like that. And now IBM is applying it in healthcare, where doctors are on average between five and ten years behind in research. Uh, so they are diagnosing you and prescribing you um, uh, treatments that do not correspond to what is the current scientific understanding. With a, an assistant like Watson, they will be able to represent the human relationship necessary in a, in a patient-physician uh, relationship, but advise you much, much better. Google's DeepMind has been recently announced uh, as being able to play at superhuman um, abilities 50 video games from the 80s um, without having been taught how to play them. The computer received feedback 
and it developed the understanding of the video game through deep learning algorithms that is now an approach being more and more widely applied for teaching computers how to understand the world. Artificial intelligence is coming and it is going to be one of those sudden shifts like solar in the Middle East or digital from chemical in imaging and we have to be ready. We have always used computers also to be better ourselves but this shift is going to be different because those machines are going to be as I said completely autonomous. Also since they are able to learn totally generally they are going to be able to apply introspection to their own states and they are going to be able to access their own source code. It took us 10,000 years to even start to understand our DNA, to even start to understand how our brain works. But AIs are going to be able to understand how they work immediately and then start to apply their optimizing uh, treats, their optimizing passion to make themselves better, to improve themselves. It will not be possible to intervene after the fact. Once this genie is out of the bottle, it is going to be defining its own direction, but it is very important to put it on the right track. And yes, it is going to develop First of all, we are talking about AI in the singular. It is going to be much better to talk about AI in the plural. So I want you to think about it as a Cambrian explosion of intelligence. Today, there is just one species that we think is intelligent. And tomorrow, there will be millions. And there will be conflict among these behaviors and these species too. So there will be an evolution through this pressure to evolve moral systems in AIs too. But we should prevent that to be happening merely on, a, on an evolutionary term because the end point of that might not be the point where we want them to arrive. We want them to build together with us a global society on Earth, on Mars, in space, wherever we will go together, that is respectful of human values and it is respectful of human individuals. And the only way to do that is to start with the right steps. That is why we need to take on the challenge of understanding how we can create an infrastructure and a superstructure that incorporates moral and ethical reasoning in our devices. We cannot postpone that. In, in a lot of areas, you know, uh, when we knew nothing about the world, we looked at the moon and the only way, and the sun, and the only way we could think about it was in metaphysical terms. In religious terms, in terms of legends and myths. And then we started to understand astronomy and we could think about those objects and those phenomena in scientific terms. For a lot of people, to think about ethics and morality in scientific terms is blasphemy. And it will be conflictual and controversial in human societies to dare and go there, to go beyond our current limits and to say, well, yes, I understand that was the case. Your religion, your belief system, has certain dictates in terms of what is moral, what is not moral. And on top of that, or alongside with that, we will now also a science of morals, an engineering of morals. And it will not be easy. A lot of people will oppose that. But I think that if we do not take on this challenge of understanding scientific morality and then incorporating it into our devices, the evolution of autonomous machines will proceed with disregard to human uh, wellness and to 
the objectives and the respect of, of humanity. So I would like to stop here. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to open it up to your questions. All right, go ahead. Yeah, so you said that uh, in the exponential technology group is putting a pressure on the idea of nation and uh, a centralized form of government. Yes. So uh, I can see that uh, technology is in most ways decentralizing. Mm -hmm. mm, but uh, like the technology growth is making more and more jobs like obsolete. Yes. First it targeted the uh, labor jobs. Now it's uh, targeting more white collar jobs. Uh, so, how will the economy of the future look like? Yes. So, uh, technological unemployment is a concern everywhere. It is not a new concern. Uh, the Luddite movement uh, in the late uh, 1700s in uh, Great Britain um, moved to destroy uh, 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 sewing machines that nascent textile industry was employing one machine replacing a hundred workers producing the same output and the uh, Luddites believed that they should not be used because then people would uh, lose their jobs and temporarily they were right because the quality of life in London at the turn of the century, uh, 200 years ago, was really bad for somebody who losing uh, his or her job was moving there and they didn't know what to do, they didn't have skills, they were often exploited, they had to work horrible hours in, in, in horrible conditions. And then things improved uh, um, and, and today it is believed that the Luddites were wrong. Um, so the question is, is the fear of technological unemployment similar to, to what was two, three hundred years ago? Will we be able to adapt to new things that we have to do? Uh, and certainly the kinds of jobs that we are doing today are um, unrecognizable to a previous generation. I think that you have the universal experience to have a very hard time to explain to your grandmother what you do or what you are planning to do after you finish school. You know, uh, I install WordPress and design new themes or I monitor social media and uh, moderate uh, conversations online. It, it's, it's very hard to explain because the basis is not there to, to do that. And in the future there will be new jobs, you know. Um, genetic counseling, for example, is a new job. It is interpreting genetic data and telling you what kind of lifestyle changes uh, you should be doing in order to maximize your benefit from that information. Or um, uh, training, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the thing I said, for example, uh, the Hindi Wikipedia. There is no reason for the Hindi Wikipedia to not be much bigger than the English one. And still it is not. There is a lot of value to be had there. Uh, yesterday I was talking to somebody about the role of translators. What will happen to translators when uh, machine translation is going to be very good? And the example I gave is that uh, human um, uh, analysis and human transformation of, of the mere translation may still be necessary until we delegate legal decision making, for example, to machines as well. However, I do think that the conversation is not enough, it's not happening enough. For example, the university system. It tells you, stay at university, four years. We tell you what to study year after year, because we know. And after four years, when you graduate, we guarantee you will have a great job. And maybe in India, but in America, for the past 10, 20 years, this was not true. And there is a perfect illustration of this. 
one trillion dollars of student loans are outstanding. These are people who took out money in order to pay for their education, who haven't paid it back yet because their earnings did not increase enough, and they cannot go away from that. They cannot bankrupt themselves out of that debt. They are basically indentured to that debt because legislation has been put in place. Every debt is in a certain class. Student loans are inherited by your parents if you die. And they have to be paid back. So this is an illustration of the system understanding that universities maybe are not such a great deal, at least in America. So the question is absolutely right. And my view is that the social contract has to be renegotiated. Today, too many people believe that the goal of your life is to work. And if you don't work, you're worthy of nothing. You're not worthy of food, you are not worthy of shelter, you are not worthy of health care, you are not worthy of consideration by your peers. What do you do? Ah, I'm looking for a job. Really? After two years, whatever, are you good? Are you not good? But we have to totally rethink this and society has to understand whether individuals deserve more than not just work. I want to take another question and then we, I, so sorry, I didn't make this, I wanted to make this as a premise before I started talking. Uh, my email, my Twitter, my Facebook, all of them are totally public, okay? So you are more than welcome to keep this conversation going even if we are not able to exhaust your curiosity today. But if you want to stop after we are done and get deeper into this, I will be more than happy to do it right now. Yes. Yes. Let's 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 hear three four questions and I will I will give more answers. Uh, so sir, uh, when we were talking about technology and you said that we also had to lay up uh, a the layer of foundation for the direction in which you want to go see. Uh, you also mentioned the point that uh, when we are working with exponential technology, we don't really know how it may turn out to be. But we also need to lay a foundation for it. So when we are not fully aware of all the consequences that technology can lead to, how is it that you may be able to lay a foundation for it? Absolutely. So um, the approaches to solutions can be different and we now can afford to try and fail. We build such a good foundation that, that we can try and if we quickly recognize that we made a mistake and we can revise what we did in an evolutionary process, then we can solve this, face this uncertainty. The uncertainty is intrinsic, but we have methods that themselves evolve on how to face them. Next question. Yes. Um, <coughs> I think that the patient is getting this and then they sort of heading towards the species level when we have this sort of species of machine. Yes. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to co evolve with these machines. Mm -hmm. right, but, but right now the, the thing is that within the human species itself, uh, within our economy, the cross economy, there's a lot of disparity which you touched upon right at the beginning of your presentation. Mm -hmm. And because of that disparity, this co evolution was not perhaps be possible for everybody, all of humanity together. Mm -hmm. And for example, I mean, wherever there's technology, there is profits. Right? Mm -hmm. there, there are companies looking to make profits. For example, mm -hmm. the internet and the whole net neutrality debate about it. Mm -hmm. So it is trying to, uh, wherever the corporates or governments enter, there's the kind of profit making. Mm -hmm. Which sort of hampers that whole idea of co-evolution and, uh, and technology reaching everybody. Mm -hmm. So how do you think uh, governments and corporates would be able to ensure that this coalition is for everybody and, and some, some part of the humanity is not left behind. Okay, so I, um, uh, I will repeat the question, I don't know if everybody heard. Uh, how can we avoid that increasing disparity uh, um, uh, disables the opportunity for everybody co to co-evolve, to everybody to move ahead with technology? And uh, 
what is important is to give the opportunity to everybody to do so um, through education, uh, through showing what are the benefits and, and, and uh, I think the mobile phone is the best example for that, uh, which is reaching, you know, even the poorest villages have at least one phone or the phone is getting there. And internet connections are now being planned with balloons or drones or all kinds of ways. Um, however, soon the opposite is going to be a bigger problem. How do we respect those who do not want to embrace the latest technological changes? For example, I have an implant. I have a chip in my hand under the skin that allows me to do certain things. Open doors, pay for the subway, I keep my Bitcoin uh, 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 security keys in this chip. And most of the people who learn about it are horrified. They are disgusted. They are, they, they, they are repelled by it. So if a large number of people in society are going to want uh, this kind of chip, what do we do with those who don't want it? And can we respect their decision? Can we hold them within society without driving them to extinction? Like we did with uh, Native Americans uh, uh, in the American continent, for example, that numbered 50 million before Europeans came, and 100 years later there were 5 million. You know, the lar largest genocide in history. And even today, uh, with all their casino money, uh, they're, they're root, they are still rootless and, and uh, the average violence and abuse uh, uh, and crime in, in, in their societies is still just way too high. There is, a, there is a social and psychological discomfort that is still there. So I think a big, big challenge is not uh, to help those who want to go ahead, but what to do with those who, who, who refuse it because there will be a point when many, many more people will do so. Uh, last question, maybe? Yes. Sure. So, uh, Hollywood is, is, is wonderful in representing conflict in certain ways, and and it is useful. Uh, movies like Terminator are kind of silly. Um, uh, who saw her? Her. Okay, I totally recommend her as a movie. H-E-R, her. Um, very, very smart about the future. Um, and when I say conflict, I mean not necessarily what we, we call war today, but certainly competition for resources, okay? And these are going to be potentially different kinds of resources. Bandwidth, uh, communication energy, uh, minerals from asteroids, um, helium-3 from the atmosphere of Jupiter. These are going to be conflicts that have very little to do with, with uh, our human needs. Uh, and uh, they may be resolved through novel conflict resolution mechanisms that do not involve uh, what we call violence and war. Um, genetic uh, evolution and, and uh, our understanding of how biology and sexual drives uh, define uh, uh, our, our species and other species are very different from memetic evolution and memetic drives. Uh, memes as the units of cultural evolution are going to be the defining factor of AI and their basic drive for knowledge. I think that Earth is wonderful, but very soon they will start looking outwards in the universe because there's so much more to be known and they will be able to uh, adapt themselves much more rapidly to space exploration than not us. So the vast majority of their concerns and their interests and their adventures are going to be out in the universe. And we will stay here and hear news of what's going on and try to understand and barely glimpse the meaning. 
but uh, we will be proud because they will be our children. Okay, thank you.